It's hard to believe that after 10 years, that notoriously bleak conclusion can still haunt me. It's an absolute emotional disembowelment so abrupt that it just cements how depressing The Mist is in retrospect. For those who haven't had their hearts ripped out of their chest before, The Mist was an overdue passion project by Frank Darabont long before producing other Stephen King adaptations, The Shawshank Redemption and The Green Mile. On the outset, there isn't anything remotely upsetting about the film's appearance. It's a low-budget science fiction horror that pays homage to the creature features of early cinema, such as the work of Ray Harryhausen and George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead, hence the originally intended black and white version and shooting in 35mm to achieve a grainy aesthetic. But like with Who Goes There and The Thing, Stephen King limited the description of the creatures to barely two or three lines to instead draw attention to this existential crisis suffered by ordinary people who are just simply trying to make sense of something so incredibly abnormal. Frank Darabont's personal masterpiece pushes beyond the original novella to instead capture a unique interpretation of a foreboding apocalypse. It isn't one driven by nature or mankind, or even some mere rapture. Darabont treats it as a punishment forced upon the characters. While Hostel 2 and Saw 4 were stroking themselves off to their own torture porn fantasies, Darabont rejected their popularity in favour of unknown horrors, even if it wasn't entirely subtle. Violence feels purposeful in Darabont's vision. Its horrifically unpleasant depiction helps to emphasise the brooding fear of death that lurks beyond the fragile windows of the convenience store. Whether it be the emphasis on Norm's scared, helpless eyes, or cute, innocent Sally succumbing to gruesome venom poisoning, or in those final moments, David breaking down in defeat over his noble but ultimately pointless actions, violence is almost exclusively focused on the agony the characters suffer as opposed to their infliction. That sense of punishment then manifests itself in the film's socio-religious themes. The narrative focuses greatly on the political divide amongst the people, which is further exacerbated by the increasing presence of religious damnation scrutinised throughout the film. Early on, Darabont establishes a visual metaphor of an isolated reality being surrounded by myth and fantasy that engulfs the outer world and slowly seeps its way inside. The store being a symbol of local American consumerism then becomes a representation of society that starts to break down. You've already psyched out half a dozen of my people already. Your people? What kind of talk is that? They are people, that's all. We have Norton's flatter society, a vocal minority who refuse to believe that there are monsters in the mist by disputing clear evidence. And then there's Mrs. Carmody's religious fanaticism, which Keane alludes to being corrupted New England Puritanism, as she almost immediately declares the need for a blood sacrifice before shit even really hits the fan. I tell you what, the day I need a friend like you, I'll just have myself a little squat and shit one out. But what's disturbing isn't the intensity of Carmody's religious delusions, it's the fact that despite how cynical religion is treated by both the characters and the story, it's ultimately just as rational against the backdrop of these Lovecraftian style creatures as any other opposing theory. It's hard to dispute the superstitious unknown when it's literally right in front of you. Hell, one character in Keane's book nihilistically suspects that the land itself is gone and there is literally nothingness in the mist. You know, like the gaping holes at the edges of Silent Hill. The story effectively plays on our inability to challenge what's in front of us, despite what we want and choose to believe both rationally and irrationally. The idea that we rely on faith that there is a god becomes less prevalent when what's happening isn't natural, so as the film progresses, even aggressive sceptics and cynics start to see eye to eye with Mrs. Carmody. Since we're invested emotionally from David's perspective, we see how the hypocrisy has manifested its way amongst the people, making for an increasingly hostile environment as opposed to one where people band together to help each other in a time of crisis. David and his group try to take such a human approach to the matter as opposed to picking sides like the other characters, his group is focused on survival and going out of their way to devise a means of protection and preservation while other characters get on their knees and pray for help. But taking yourself out of David's sceptical shoes, it's honestly easy to understand their sudden tribal mentality. These people have gone through an existential crisis to try and comfort themselves as to how to rationalise or embrace what is happening. 
They're desperate like any other normal human being, so taking Mrs. Carmody's side is their attempt, whether it be ignorant or sincere, to simply latch on to some form of hope and salvation for the future. This fear is reinforced by makeup and creature designer Greg Nicotero and video effects supervisor Everett Burrell developing monsters that are an abstract hybrid between organic worldly creatures we fear such as spiders and mosquitoes and human phobias based on scale, sight, and mind. Things ordinary in the real world that ignite fear are heightened into a nightmarish version that it overrides any logical or realistic justification basically both a figurative and literal attempt to put the fear of God in the characters. In fact, Stephen King describes one creature as simply a Bosch painting, an allusion to the 15th century painter Hieronymus Bosch, who was famous for his macabre, nightmarish, and abstract depictions of hell. In The Last Judgment, it actually reads that the fallen angels from heaven are turned into demons as metaphorical insects while Adam and Eve are chased into the dark forest for the judgement of their sins, before passing into hell where the wicked fools, as Mrs. Carmody later describes them, are punished. It mirrors much of the film itself, the metaphorical insects fallen from heaven insinuated by the cloudy mist, while David and his group are technically banished from their Eden into judgement for which they are tortured and punished physically and psychologically. This speaks of everyone that leaves the store, whether their experience be positive or negative, like with the woman with kids at home, Norton's grip, Wayne who is directly perceived to be crucified for being sent out into the mist, and eventually David's grip, they all experience personal ordeals in their time of judgement. Now, our critics interpret Bosch's work as a representation of medieval morality and the unorthodox religious teachings about the fallacy of mankind, despite little context because Bosch's life is mostly a mystery. But it honestly says a lot about Mrs. Carmody's character given her bizarre religious practices, immorality, and how mysterious it perceives her to be given, you know, she's somehow fucking married. Bosch's work often depicted paradise being consumed by damnation or, symbolically, realism being engulfed by nightmare and fantasy. The Garden of Earthly Delights, for example, can be viewed as a warning against sin and corruption, the illusion of a false paradise like Earth being a testing ground for the people, according to Mrs. Carmody, and the issue of lust and temptation, which again, Mrs. Carmody speaks vividly of. Her point about temptation is interpreted differently in both the novella and the film. In the book, David is having an affair with Amanda, whereas the film replaces it with David's final act of execution, carrying the theme in a different direction. Specifically in the book, David starts to believe in Mrs. Carmody's visions as he drives through the mist, and prays to God that his wife is still alive and not to take his adultery out on her. But I feel Darabont's decision to completely overhaul the ending works dramatically in its favour over the book's ambiguous conclusion. The biggest distinction is that all of Keane's ambiguities and implications are practically given some form of answer and very little speculation is actually left in the hands of the audience to drive home the idea that religion, despite being critically perceived by the narrative, has an important role in easing or reinforcing society's distress. It's death. We know what happens to those who leave or remain in the store, we know what happens to David's wife, and most of all, we get confirmation it was a science experiment opening a portal to another dimension that caused everything. Which I think, for the record, is implied to be a Dark Tar reference, especially given David is painting the gunslinger in the opening of the film, which also just so happens to be painted by the man who made the Thing movie poster in the background. The only real mystery the film leaves open to us is, why does the mist suddenly stop? It overrides almost every question that came before it because in that very moment, the audience is totally transfixed on David and his actions. Once in the car, everything foreshadows their fate, and the spiritual overtones are further accentuated by the use of Dead Can Dance's soundtrack, The Hosts of Seraphim. The film lingers on the corpse of a decaying child, symbolising David's fear for his son's safety right before feeling significantly more guilt for not fixing the broken window that indirectly got his wife killed, further implying what will eventually happen to them in this futile attempt find sanctuary. 
It calls back to Carmody's belief that David's son should be a human sacrifice. Once his son dies, the mist abruptly comes to an end. Carmody, for as crazy as the story makes her to be, is never technically disproven. Her views actually align closely to what the Arrowhead Project has done. Nobody wants to admit it, but she's not exactly wrong in her insane beliefs. Well, I'm going, even if I have to go alone. You'll die out there, young man. You'll walk out that door and be torn to shreds, and then your hellbound pride will have them come get the rest of us. The hope that the novellas David holds on to is completely subverted by Darabont, who, yes, gives humanity direct hope for the future but at the expense of the soul-crushing temptation that David rushes into. He isn't a bad guy, but in religious teachings, his sins are treated with greater prejudice. There is immense condemnation given to pride which David exhibits throughout the entire film. Since we're trapped in his shoes, his punishment is clearer to the viewer. He's attempting to hold back contempt for his neighbour in falsehood, he refuses to help a worried woman to protect his own child, he refuses to embrace even the idea of God, you know, real normal human stuff that the Bible isn't too fond of. In fact, for as much as it adds a shred of justification that sacrificing his son was the only means of stopping the mist, I still don't think Darabont necessarily intended that. The final real execution prior to David's grip was Mrs. Carmody, the sole influence for spreading God's wrath, who, in essence, is sacrificed for her devoted faith by a group of skeptical, non-converted sinners. In the reality of her narrative, she's the only real redeemed and spiritually good character, so once David's group escape, the reason the mist doesn't just vanish then is because they are ultimately driving away from salvation triggered by Carmody's sacrifice at the hands of sinners. Even with God removed from the equation, if we were to chalk it down to realistic coincidence and one of life's sudden transitions, it still hits home that, regardless of rational or spiritual action, David's group were always doomed in his hands as he led them astray into evil. The Bible remarks frequently about the good shepherd leading his flock, and David was following this parable with good intentions, but also falsely with diminishing faith in hope, and with pride that they didn't remain confined to the culture of supposedly irrational thinkers within the store. His actions are only and rationally human, but in a world now consumed by unordinary creatures, Carmody's claims of judgement are indeed just as rational as his own beliefs. Regardless, the mist clears, so it's not like it's the end of the world, but maybe it is for David. Hey folks, thanks for watching. It's 3am right now. Um, I'm having so much fun making these videos, but I don't want to make anyone up. Um, if you enjoy what I do here and if you like the videos we're making, uh, we're so close off our first goal on Patreon. So if you like what we do, please do consider pledging a dollar or two. And until next time, stay safe and I'll see you all very, very soon. Okay, bye.